Greetings and welcome to this episode of Everyday Enchantment. I am your host, Stacey Anden, and I am so excited for this conversation today. My guest on Everyday Enchantment is Amy Bernstein. She is a Baltimore writer and author, and what I love about her bio is that she's an experimental writer, poems and plays and messing around with the convention conventions of fiction just already has got me excited to talk and find out more about all of this. And Amy weaves social injustice and human rights into her stories. And she wants to tell stories to let people feel, which I absolutely love that the feeling and the thinking and how we can use creativity in our own lives, particularly if we've gotten to the middle of our lives and we really want to get in touch with that. That's what we're talking about today. And I can't wait. <music> Greetings. Welcome, Amy. It's so fabulous to have you here today. Thank you for being part of this podcast with me. Stacy, I am so excited. I loved your intro, so I can't wait to, I'm glad to be here and I can't wait till we get into the conversation. Oh, I ditto. I was doing all sorts of research for this episode and I'm looking at all your books and I'm like, I need to add all of these to my Kindle queue and, and be spending my summer reading a lot of what you just, it looks like you just came out with a new novel, The Night Hawkers. And I'm like, that's getting added immediately to my list. So my first question is just kind of tell us if there's something more. I just gave a quick bio to the listeners. If there's something more. How did you kind of find yourself in this place as an author and writer? Yeah, that's such a big question, isn't it? And, you know, it's it's funny because um, I think I always wanted to be a writer, but for most of my life, well into adulthood, I thought that you couldn't call yourself a writer unless you were really special that it was a really special name for special people and I was not special, which is ironic because actually I made my living in nonfiction as a writer for decades as a journalist in print and public radio and doing a lot of high-end communications work. And I've sort of touched almost all the parts of the, the elephant that you can writing nonfiction, but you know, I didn't call myself a writer. So it's it's been a real stepping into kind of process to, to kind of own it, claim it. I love that because I was an English teacher when I first got started. And I always used to joke that I became a teacher of writing and reading because I was kind of like a closet writer and I wasn't ready really to step into that yet. So I was teaching other people how to do it. And then finally, I just decided one day guess what? There isn't somebody coming to knock on the door to say, Stacy, it's official. You're a writer. You can just decide. You're sp like, to your point about being special, you are it already. And I just had that moment. And I, I'm curious, like, how did you, how did you claim that? How did you come into that space for yourself? I think it was a couple of different things. I think, I think that getting older and, you know, I consider myself an extremely late bloomer and there's nothing wrong with that. But finally realizing that we have the right to claim ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have the right to claim and proclaim who we are and what labels that we use for our own identity. And I think that we, we don't see that conversation on the cre about among creatives as we much as much as we do about other kinds of identity, which are also so important. But I mean, I think that if if you if you feel that urge to kind of put words on paper in any form, in any order, in any way whatsoever, or even deliver it, you know, as a spoken word artist, I mean, you are a writer, you are a literary, you are creating literary work. And so I think I finally felt the courageous enough to own it. Plus, I started writing a lot. <laughs> and and certainly once I started publishing, uh, once I was I had plays produced, and then once I started getting into novels and, and certainly getting to the point of publishing, I was like, okay, yes, this is, we can do this now. We can call ourselves a writer. I love that. I, I love this, like taking it back for ourselves. And you're right. We probably don't talk about it enough in the creative world around that. And it does, it, it, 
to me, there's a confidence too when we take that back within ourselves to say yes, and I'm I'm all I'm all in that. And I have a question for you. So one of the things I loved what you said is you refuse to be pinned down by a genre. And maybe I'm I I have again, a similar sense. I wouldn't, I've never phrased it like that, but I don't like to be in a box. And if there's some kind of rule or something that needs to be broken, I'm all for it, whether it has to do with writing or coaching or creativity. It's like, how do we break that? How did you really like, again, embody that and come into that knowing? Because that is, again, I think can be life-changing. Well, that's, I would say that really was driven purely by intuition, intuition, not by intent, by which I mean, you know, I am now clearly a multi-genre author. And I didn't say to myself, well, okay, you're going to start writing novels and you're going to write in all different genres. And this is how it's going to go. I would find the story that I really wanted to tell and think about the form that it needed to be told. And it just so happened that that has taken me from, you know, young adult fiction to young adult fantasy, but to adult dystopian mystery thriller and certainly to um, a sort of a, 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 a romance, a non-fluffy romance. And I have loved exploring all of these genres. It's really wonderful. I love that. It reminds me years ago when I was in life coaching school, we had this kind of moment where we were talking about, you know, what kind of work we were going to do in the world once we all became certified life coaches. And one of the teachers in the program said, instead of deciding what you think it should do, it's kind of like that Park, if you know who Parker Palmer is, there's this quote that he famously, or at least I feel famously says, listen to your life. It's the same thing. Listen to whatever wants to move through you and ask it, what form does it want to come through? And I think this just kind of segues really nice into this, what we wanted to talk about together today, which is how do you connect or reconnect with creativity? Get to the middle of your life. A lot of people I work with, a lot of people are like, ah, it's just like this kind of like, this is it kind of feeling. And they also kind of coupled with that say, well, I'm not creative. You know, I'll say, well, let's play around. And 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 somebody might say, well, you are creative, but I'm not. And I would say, well, everybody's creative. But how do we get in touch with that? And like, again, instead of thinking it has to be a certain way, allow it to speak to us. And again, that's right up my alley with intuition. Well, you know, Stacey, you, you bring up so many important points and you say listening through your life or listening to your life. And I wonder if you agree with my observation that I think what stops us from knowing that part of ourselves or allowing ourselves to know that part of ourselves is really just plain old fear. The fear is such a powerful blocker. It keeps us from knowing truths about ourselves that are right there. We yes. just can't connect those dots because fear, it's like a door that you, that's locked and you can't walk through where, well, I think you, you would know as a life coach and I would certainly affirm you can, you can yes. open that door, you can <laughs> walk through. And I think we, our culture is, you know, we live in a culture that where there's so much scrutiny and ridicule and people are so quick to put you down and so quick to tell you that you're not this, you're not this, or you, you can't do this, or you can't do that, <clears throat> that we need so much more affirmation. But that affirmation, it's hard for that affirmation to come from ourselves for ourselves when externally we're really swimming in so much negativity. Yeah. And how powerful for someone who does the kind of work that you do to help someone realize, you know, I'm going to help you get out of your way because you, you are so much more. And it, you know, it's so funny that I just said that line, you are so much more, because in The Nighthawkers, the book that I just released, that's a, um, it's a, it's a love story, a time traveling, paranormal, archaeology love story. Sounds amazing. One of the, but one of the themes of the book is the protagonist basically discovering herself and finding her real, her real self and her real power and her real destiny and being able to say to others, you are more and helping others sort of find that. So it's about being able to do that deep dive. And, and I think it's great for people to be willing to seek help to take that journey because we can't always do that on our own. Well, and I think that that's, I mean, storytellers like you and me, and we're a little bit different maybe in our mediums, but that's 
at the heart, how do we help people as they interact and engage with a story to really give themselves permission, right? To me, it's like, do it your way. How do we do that? And so sometimes reading about a character and really getting engaged that way can help us because it feels really safe, right? When you're in a book and engaged in it, you can allow yourself, at least I always do, allow myself to really be able to let the floodgates open and not be as worried about the fear. And I love what you said about fear because you're right. It knocks right on our door. And I've always use this kind of metaphor of like the big bad wolf is like fear and it's knocking at the door. And most of us are like, we need to run and relocate. (laughs) And I always say, open the door, open the door and let, let whatever you're most afraid of come in and befriend it. Because when we're allies with our fear, I think fear can be, whatever the message is in there, can be such a beautiful kind of agent of you know, creativity, it can say, Ooh, this is, you know, you are meant to be a storyteller. You are meant to be experimenting in lots of different ways, maybe because your audience is varied and diverse and isn't in, you know, just romance or, you know, in one place that you're meant to be touching all these lives in so many different ways. And, and when we can say, maybe it's not, you know, again, getting rid of the fear, but I always think of it like if it, you let it walk with you, then it has a lot less power than when it's outside, like beckoning at you. I don't know if you found, found that to be true. Yeah, I, I was thinking along very similar lines because what I've learned, really learned from my own experience is that being afraid of what you're afraid of is worse than letting than letting the fear happen, than letting, yes. let, doing the thing that you're, that you're afraid to do. Yeah. So it, just to try to be clear about that. It's worse in our imaginations. It, we, we think about a step we might want to take, but it's terrifying. And that that terrifyingness, which is sort of abstract, is far worse than doing the thing you're actually terrified of. And believe me, I know this. I have, you know, as a writer, I've experienced so much rejection. And, you know, I've also done things in public that, that haven't worked out um, so well. I've taken so many creative risks that involved other people and public settings and attention on me. And it doesn't work out every time. And once you, once you experience that rejection, you experience the big no, and you experience, you know, failure, something that doesn't go the way you imagined it, then you realize, okay, that happened let's move on. And then you're just going to go on to the next thing. And the worst that can happen is that there's, there might be more failure around the corner, but that's just not, that's not, that's not a thing that has to force, stop you. It's just not a force that has to stop you. I couldn't agree more. And the capacity for us to hold failure or wrong turns or however people do that is I think commiserate or commiserate with with how much then we can really allow ourselves to shine and and put out, you know, whatever we want to call that, our genius or our gifts to the world, when you're willing to be like failure is part of the actual process and not something to deter us. I always like, ooh, what's here for me? I know I'm, I'm probably not a typical person, but I've I've really practiced leaning in rather than leaning out to it. And you're right, when you want to, you know, really claim who you are and, and do that work out in the world, be creative, that vulnerability, I think comes right alongside with it. And I don't know about you, but it also has to do with then being grounded in my own worth around Mm -hmm. who I already am, the creativity, the novel, the whatever the, the final product is, so to speak, doesn't determine whether I'm an incredible being on this planet. It just says, oh, that maybe that wasn't the right container or that didn't work exactly the way I thought it would work, but it doesn't make me or break me in either direction. And that is the hardest thing because it's so hard not to internalize failure as the equivalent it simply is defining you. And look, I have had these dark nights of the soul. I have had many of them when, you know, I, I wasn't, um, couldn't get an agent and I wasn't finding a publisher. And I thought, I can't believe that I've, I have failed at this. I am a failure. You know, I've, I have lived with that. I have walked around with that. I have 
you know, laying awake with it. I have awoken with it. And at the end of the day, you, you have a choice. You can just, you can keep going and mm-hmm. still try and be that person that you know that you are and are becoming and can become and set everything else to the side. Just keep marching. And because otherwise, you know, you're going to stop marching and and then what? So you may as well keep going. And those voices don't go away, but you really can. um, You can, you can compartmentalize them just a bit and say, yep, I do feel that way. But you know what, I'm just going to keep going over here because something good could happen over here. And I think, I think we do have to do, we have to do both. We have to hold both in our minds at the same time, as you, as you say. I totally agree. So I'm so curious when you are kind of nurturing people kind of to find their kind of creative, first of all, how do you define a creative center? Because I just, this sounds such like a juicy term and I'm like, oh, I want to know more about this. How do you envision that to be? You, you know, um, I think it begins with um, not thinking about creativity in the typical terms of Oh, I'm good at X. I'm good at Y. I make amazing cakes. I'm an amazing charcoal artist on paper. I think it starts with um, what what risks am I willing to take and how far am I willing to push those risks? I think a great deal of creativity is about taking risks. And when you look at the history of artists in every medium through the ages, That's what they did every time. I mean, you know, moving moving from figurative painting to abstract painting. I mean, those artists were taking risks. They were creating work that no one had seen. Mm -hmm. You know, the Salon de Refusé. People hated the work. Stravinsky writing the um, creating the Rite of Spring, which which had um, dissonant uh, harmonies in it, and and people uh, stomped and booed and and stormed out of the premiere uh, performance in I think 1912 or 1913. I mean, it really starts with being willing to take a risk whether you're whether you're the best at doing that thing or not isn't even the point or the question it's the willingness to step into the risk which is you know about courting failure but it's also about courting something amazing i love this and i also think tell me what you think about this it's what wants to move through me right so when you're willing to take the risk it's also like is a story want to come like what is it that i feel drawn to what 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 nudges am i getting intuitively do i feel like Ooh, this, you know, maybe I want to play around with poetry or I want to, to explore something, you know, just, I know last year at one point I was like, I haven't really paint. I mean, I kind of dabbled in a little bit of painting for fun before I went to the art store and I just bought a bunch of things. I didn't research it. I just was like, what calls to me? And then I bought paper and I just started messing around with to your point without any expectation of what this has to be or what people will think it needs to be i just was like what if i just start by noticing what i'm drawn to and just being curious and playful with it i love that <laughs> because you get you simply gave yourself permission you didn't have to look many of us are rule followers and yes. we're, we're we're partly we're saying you know what Rules are great, but forget the rules. Give yourself permission to not even think that there are any rules. You can make the rules. And, you know, the rules can be no rules. And so what you did is you just scooped up that stuff and you just did what you wanted. Let me say something about poetry, because I actually write a lot of poetry now, and I never imagined I would do that. And I love the form so much. And I wrote an essay um, called Confessions of an Unschooled Poet, in which I basically said, look, I never studied poetry. I don't know the forms of poetry. I don't know what a Sistina is. You know, I can't really, I, I couldn't even properly define a sonnet, which is about as basic as it gets. You know, I can barely explain to you what a haiku is. I think I got that one. But I, you know, I, all these things, all poetry is full of rules and mm-hmm. it's full of, of amazing poets who followed all these rules. And I don't know the rules. And you know what? I have written and published poetry anyway, and I've gotten incredibly positive, meaningful feedback on my poetry, which has connected with a lot of people. And it just reinforced for me exactly what you did when you walked into that art store, which is, you know what, I am compelled to write this this way and say this in this form. And I may not understand the form. I may not have a history of studying this form. So what? It's going to be emotionally honest and thoughtful. And that's what I do. And it's it's just so rewarding when you let yourself do that. I love that. 
everything you just said reminds me of, I don't know if you know him, he's no longer on the planet, but Dr. Wayne Dyer. And one of the, one of my favorite quotes he said that I always keep kind of just tucked somewhere right nearby is don't die with the music left inside you. Mm -hmm. And it's not like, whatever you said, like, it's not a sonnet necessarily. It's like, what is my music? What is it that I want to contribute? And I think every day we get up and we just show up in the world and we speak and we put, you know, whatever our style, like we're already creating and, and adding to, you know, the art of the world. It doesn't look exactly like, again, how maybe some people would define it, but if we start to just widen the lens way more and give ourselves more permission it's like everything can be my day the way i just move in and out um can be a piece of art so i love to just i i'm all about looking at what the convention says and go oh does that fit for me and if it doesn't it's like what do i want to do instead and you're right it starts with just asking myself what's the risk that i'm willing to take and to me, it's not about, hey, I have to go to the deep end, right? And and like right. be paralyzed by a risk. What's the smallest step out that still feels like a risk, but also feels like, you know, really juicy and I, and I want to play with that. And yes. And, you know, as we're, as we're heading down that, that path, I think that because our culture uh, celebrates success so much. Mm -hmm that um we have to remind ourselves that when we when we step into doing when we, when we start experimenting those ways it's not about being quote unquote really good at something or the best at something that's that's another thing that you need to just blow right past it's yeah. about doing the thing that just feels you feel passionately connected to or the thing where you get into what they call the flow which is you're kind of unaware of time passage of time and you know sensations around you because you're so engrossed in the thing and whatever the thing is. And, um, you know, we really don't, shouldn't, we shouldn't say at the outset, well, you know, I'll, I'm not good at that, or I'll never be good at that. That, I mean, if you want to play the violin, don't worry about being good at it, you know, just love the, 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 the incredible journey of what's the bow like across the, st the strings? What's it like interpreting the, the notes? What's it like just thinking about, you know, connecting and, and making that music and don't worry about whether, whether you're good at it, find the joy in it. I think that's the other key, getting rid of the fear and finding the joy. I'm with you. I mean, that, there's everyday enchantment in, an, <laughs> in the best, succinctest way. And I think, tell me what you think about this, but I think a lot of people get to midlife, have followed all the rules, have looked for the outer markers of success, right? I do this because it's going to get me something. Right. It's, you know, there's some destination and then we get to the middle of our lives and we go, wait, that's, you know, a lot of people are like, wait, this is, this is not that joyful. And yet we haven't really learned or practiced or given ourselves permission to say, well, what actually does without all of those programs and conditions and the paradigms out there in the world. So it's breaking some of those to be able to find again, that place where I think we were taught like we needed the rules, right? We needed that in order to create something to be successful. And it's like, maybe, may, I'm not saying there's absolute in either way, but maybe not. And if that's true, what really does want to surface through you that maybe you've held down? I mean, I know a lot of people are like, I became an accountant because it was a safe job and and that's what my parents wanted and they were worried about me making money, but I wanted to be a photographer. I wanted to be a musician. And people didn't give themselves permission to, again, even just to create just, maybe it wasn't your day job, so to speak, but just they put it on a shelf somewhere because it didn't have purpose like the way the world would say, oh, well, you're going to make money. You're going to get success that way. So people just kind of shelved it. And then they get to this place where it's like, wait a second, why did I do <laughs> Why did I well, do that? You know, you're, you're right. And we, we in, Amer in America and most, much of Western culture, but certainly in the U.S., we, that side, that creative part of ourselves atrophies over many decades because we're not given easy permission or license to practice it now there are many people who do manage to to do both and that's that's sure. wonderful they're able to but but many more of us do not and might have otherwise and one of the things i always you know come back to is that 
you know, in the United States, you can you can train for many, many professions. You can go to school for many professions. And yes, of course, you can go to school for, for arts related things. But there's not there aren't easy jobs to step into. There's no way to easily support yourself in the creative fields. We really let people we let them sort of hang out to dry in so many ways. You know, in France, they at least they used to. I mean, I don't know whether they still do. You know, artists could earn an actual government stipend or salary. Mm -hmm. They actually paid artists and you know yes we have grants and things of that nature but it's they're hard to get and it's yeah. a lot of work to get a grant and not everybody can get a grant and the grant amounts are often not enough to they can barely sustain your project they can't sustain you and we don't reward artists because we don't value them yes we value celebrities who might be mm -hmm. artists but that's because they're celebrities not because yeah. they're artists <laughs> I agree. And I love this idea of, you know, again, being introspective, which is another reason why when I read, I think about this too, because the characters have values, right? Or something comes up as a belief in something. When I'm reading other people's stories, I'm always kind of flushing it through. It's like, what do I truly believe? Is this somebody else's belief or is this actually mine? And I think, I don't know, I feel a lot more permission in the middle of my life to, to ask those kinds of questions and be willing to be like, yeah, no, that doesn't, that, that came from somebody, which I, I honor that, but it doesn't actually be like it's not true for me and what is that that those questions of like hmm, what's important to me now is way more about people being true to themselves I, I truly believe we want to create a beautiful community allowing people that space to really explore that and and find those answers and express themselves it's actually going to create like, again, that's the path of that personal journey is going to create this beautiful community where people then can offer their gifts. And art to me, it's like, I don't want to live on a planet without music and books and poet, all of it. It just makes life to me like it's the delight. It's the enchantment. It's the magic of living right. here as right. a human. Well, perhaps one day we'll teach it again in school so children can get that exposure. Yes, <laughs> it's so, yes, because, yes. You know, it's, it, it's, we're denying a part of our humanity and it's actually mm -hmm. the original part. I mean, you know, earliest humans were, were banging and making rhythms, right? And I was looking yeah. up the, the root right. word for enchantment, which, you know, goes back to singing in Latin, right? The root words go back to, to making that noise and, and do, using rhythm and using the human voice. And we have, we have denied ourselves access to that in so many forms in our modern, in our modern world, which is, you know, unfortunate. I love it. I love, yes. Let's go make some, whatever your, our individual noise is, go make Let's it. Let's go make learn, it. Practice. So what would you say if somebody's listening and they're like, oh, they're just getting excited by listening to this conversation. How do you, cause I know you're also a coach. How do you help people just like take the first step. What what do you offer to people when they're starting to get roused around their creativity? Right. Well, I'm sort of as a book coach. So, yeah. um, which you know, and a book coach is partly a life coach, but it is also a more specialized yes, thing. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so you know, I'm working with um authors and aspiring authors who are, I'm working on the nonfiction side. There are also certified fiction coaches, but. They, they've got that idea and they can't let go of that idea, but they don't know how to develop it and sort of bring it to life. Mm -hmm. And so what a coach or a book coach can do, and I think there's an analog with life coaching as well, is really help you take the steps and find the structure and the path that, that brings your idea to life kind of a piece at a time until it's, until it's sort of undeniable and you know you really figure out what you have to write and what your what your point really is and who you're really writing for and that definitely is a process um it's yeah. very exciting to go to take that to take that process to, to take that journey with with other people with other writers i love i love that and you're right and i'm sorry for my, I, the clarification of the book coach but i do think right we're nurturing people are birthing yes. things yes. books yes. changes in their life all sorts of things around all of that and and coaches really do help hold space 
for people. I think great coaches hold that space and it doesn't look the same for every client or every person. And I always just say, if you're getting that nudge and it's not going away, like pay attention, (laughs) whether it's a book that wants to come through you, whether it's some other thing that you want to do. And maybe I also love the idea of like, take yourself out on some creativity dates. Like uh, Julia Cameron is like, you know, in her, how to, oh, what's the name of the book? Something about being an artist. She mentions like, take your inner artist out on a date. And I love the idea of that because when there's no expectation and you can be playful, then whatever that really is that's inside of you, you start to give it room to grow and to have a conversation with you and to really, again, without making it have to mean something right away, you're in that really beautiful kind of dreaming and creation state with it. That's a lovely, lovely idea. And you have to just blow past your fear in order to do that and give yourself permission. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. Amy, I could talk to you. I could, I, this is just such a beautiful conversation. I'm inspired already by just listening to your ideas and your perspectives. And I'm so thankful that we got connected as Baltimoreans together. And if people want to find you, if they want to work with you as a, a, you know, as you're with your book coaching, or they want to read your work out in the world, how do they find you? How do they connect? The single best place is to just visit my website, amywrites.live. If you join my email list, you will get my newsletter. You may get a free gift. Mm -hmm. And you can see all the books that have been published and are forthcoming. And I do have um, some information on there about the book coaching, which will take you somewhere else. But really, it's sort of a one-stop shop. And I hope readers uh, readers will take a chance on some of my books. Totally. I'm in. I'm the Nighthawkers. Like I said, I'm adding it to my Kindle. Great. Great. (laughs) After, as soon as we get off the podcast, thank you so much again for being here. It was a beautiful conversation. And for all the listeners, thank you for listening in. If you have a question you want to ask me about this topic or anything else, pop over to my Facebook group, Everyday Enchantment, and we will jam and talk more about this topic. Thank you, Stacey. This was just a terrifically fun half hour. Oh, agreed. That's it for now, loves. Thank you for tuning into this episode. Get all the juicy details and links we've mentioned in the show notes. If learning more about how you can use your own enchantment to live a oh hell yes life, come get your own coaching session with me by going to stacyandon.com and signing up for my homepage. And as always, come chat with me about this topic and all things enchantment in my Facebook group, Everyday Enchantment. See you on the flip side.